Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our program, A History of Mount Auburn Cemetery. My name is Helen Liu and I'm the Programming and Partnerships Manager at Cary Library. I'd like to thank the Friends of Cary Library for sponsoring this program. I also want to thank the public libraries in Ashland, Bedford and Tewksbury for partnering with us on this program. This program is part of our Beyond the Library series, which introduces attendees to the many fun and educational opportunities that our Museum Pass program offers. Although you don't need a pass to visit the Mount Auburn Cemetery, Cary Library does have 23 discounted passes to a variety of wonderful places. Please check with your local library for information on their Museum Pass program. This program is being recorded and will be posted to the library's YouTube channel. If you have any questions, please enter them into the Q&A or chat. Now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Megel Winslow is a curator of historical collections and archives at Mount Auburn Cemetery, where she is responsible for developing and overseeing the cemetery's permanent collections, including more than 3,500 linear feet of archives, a library, historic photographs, works of art, significant artistic monuments on the grounds, and stained glass. In 2013, Meg led the successful implementation of an Institute for Museum Services, at IMLS, Museums for America grant to document and research Mount Auburn's significant monument collection, the first cemetery to receive such a grant. She is a co-author with Melissa Barza of the Art of Commemoration in America's First Rural Cemetery, Mount Auburn's significant monument collection in its third printing. Welcome, Meg. We are so pleased to have you join us tonight. Thank you, Helen, and thank you everyone for joining us on this gray day. I hope this picture brings you a little bit of spring, and uh, I'm just I'm just honored to be speaking with people who love books and libraries, and I'm really privileged to have uh, have this invitation from the Cary Memorial Library and um, the Minuteman Libraries. So. Uh, welcome. As Helen said, my name is Meg Winslow. I've, I've worked at Mount Auburn Cemetery for about a little over 30 years now, so I have lots of stories I'd like to share with you. Uh, tonight we're going to uh, focus a little bit on what the landmarks are at the cemetery and on the beginnings of, of Mount Auburn and what the climate was that brought about this extraordinary uh, new landscape to the United States. It's wonderful to be here together as we kind of emerge from, from the winter. Uh, in the spirit of Women's History Month, I would like to acknowledge two avid re readers and library frequenters. Janet Haywood was Vice President of Interpretive Programs at Mount Auburn a colleague, and she expanded the ways in which Mount Auburn and all cemeteries uh, can be interpreted to the public. Decades ago, when Blanche Linden was a graduate student at Ohio, she walked into the Mount Auburn Cemetery office and asked if she could look at the record, published her dissertation, and then she published a uh, really groundbreaking pioneering uh, research done on American cemeteries. It was a kind of comprehensive social history of Mount Auburn. So two great women uh, to celebrate during this month. Today, I'm gonna to give you a kind of armchair tour through the cemetery and uh, share with you some of its remarkable history. Mount Auburn, as many of you may know, actually, who are on this webinar, is a place uh, that's just it's a place to return to again and again in every season. There's nothing like being there held in the landscape. So I, I do hope if you haven't been that you you have the time to go and, and walk through. It's 175 acres of green space on the boundary of Cambridge and Watertown. It's four miles uh, west of Boston. You can kind of see this connection if you follow the the Charles River from Boston, which you would do. Um, and over here, nestled between Fresh Pond and the, the winding, meandering Charles River is this 
beautiful, beautiful green space. It's a space where birds would would come to stay and uh, and are beginning right right now as as spring as spring arrives. But you really get that sense from this um, Google map that it's a much needed uh, green space in this urban area. Again, 175 acres, and it's located four miles west of Boston and just outside of Harvard Square on uh, public transportation. Mount Auburn, is, as Helen said, is actually, it's free to all public. Anyone can come and visit um, free of charge and walk through the landscape um, 365 days of, year, of the year. And we, we welcome you. If you drive, you might recognize this uh, very large uh, granite, Quincy Granite Gateway, um, driving back and forth between Harvard Square and Watertown Square. You'll see this imposing um, entranceway to the cemetery. It was really meant to be sublime and iconic and permanent when it was finally built in Quincy Granite. And uh, it's been welcoming visitors into uh, the cemetery for almost 200 years, designed by Jacob Bigelow, who is one of the founders of the cemetery. So just a beautiful tract of land inside. And I'm, I'm very partial to this photograph. It's not one of those um, breathtakingly beautiful photographs, but it reveals the sense of belonging in the landscape, the way the landscape can hold you and even turkeys and other wildlife. Um, so there are these gorgeous acres of land to walk through. The cemetery is, um, the first thing you'll notice when you walk through is the trees. They're remarkable and the cemetery is an arboretum and a botanical garden. Uh, when it's spring, it gets to be crowded and actually it's that time of year now when we have Mother's Day coming up and Memorial Day coming up and graduations and a lot of people visiting the grounds for the beautiful blooms and the flowers that are um, bursting. And uh, we're very thankful for our staff and volunteers who welcome people to the grounds and, and offer you uh, a map and offer a map. And I actually really enjoy looking at maps to get my bearings and I'm hoping to kind of locate you here. You walk in at the at the top of this map, you walk in to these lush um, acres of green space and you can follow these winding roads up and into the cemetery away from the noise of the streets and really get lost in contemplation and um, in, your, in your thoughts. There's a green line that takes you back to the beginning um, uh, because it really is a landscape in which you in which you get lost. So as you walk up Central Avenue, which is the main street at Mount Auburn, you'll see on your left uh, one of our two chapels, Story Chapel, which was designed by Willard Sears, who also did the Isabella Stewart Gardner uh, home and museum. She's buried here at Mount Auburn. He also did, interestingly, the Provincetown uh, Monument out in Provincetown. Uh, on your right, there's an incredible garden that I like to think of as the foyer to the cemetery, the en entryway. And it's a it's a, a all season, a four season garden that was just recently renovated by our staff working with um, some horticulturalists and and the plants are just spectacular. And, and kind of welcome you into the cemetery as you walk up and into the landscape. If you walk up the hill, you'll, you'll come across the Bigelow Chapel, which was the first building at Mount Auburn. And along with uh, the entrance gateway, this was uh, also designed by Jacob Bigelow, the first building um, built in the 1840s and, and 50s, also out of Quincy Granite. And it's a small chapel, which along with Story Chapel um, holds events and uh, memorial services and, and funerals. Both, both buildings are actively, actively used. Inside, 
There's some spectacular stained glass, very early stained glass from Edinburgh, Scotland. On one end, there's a rose window. And then on the, on the opposite end, this beautiful uh, rondelle of a, an angel carrying two infants to heaven, which would have been a very comforting symbol uh, for a funerary chapel in the 19th century. Um, it's all hand painted glass and really worth seeing when you visit the cemetery. Through the, if, you, if we go back and look out the door here, you can see the Civil War Memorial, which is a Sphinx, which is, um, it really functions as a public memorial for the end of the Civil War. And it was commissioned by Jacob Bigelow who designed the chapel that it faces in um, looking forward to the, you know, of destruction of the war, putting the war behind us and looking to the future. He, he specifically chose the Sphinx. And if you do go to Forest Hill Cemetery, you can see an incredible memorial to the carver of this Sphinx. Um, that's where he's, he's buried. His name is Martin Milmore. And um, there's a beautiful bronze memorial for him that depicts the Sphinx here at Mount Auburn. It depicts him carving, carving the Sphinx at Mount Auburn. Above all, Mount Auburn Cemetery uh, is an active and working cemetery. Uh, ever since uh, it opened in 1831, anyone uh, of any religion or any race could be buried here. If you could pay for it, you could be buried at Mount Auburn. And also something interesting about the way the cemetery is set up is that it doesn't have different sections to bury different groups or different um, kinds of people. You could just choose wherever you wanted to be. Uh, wherever you wanted to be buried. Mount, Auburn, um, Mount Auburn's core mission is to, is to bury and commemorate the dead and console the bereaved, while at the same time invite all visitors from all walks of life into the cemetery. And what would you come and see? You would come and see a beautiful collection of monuments that you know help to commemorate uh, the more than 100,000 people that are buried here. The monuments with their imagery and their symbolism and their um, materials and their location have so many stories to tell. And you can, you can kind of pick any subject and uh, go walking through the cemetery and, and, and find, find it out really. Uh, a wonderful museum without walls. In the archives, we have a collection of letterhead that tells us more about the makers. There are some very famous 19th century carvers and um, some people who were more in the trades. Um, and really there are monuments from all, over, from all over the world that you can find here. I mentioned there are more than 100,000 people who are um, remembered at Mount Auburn, and um, I know there are about 542 barrels each year. So we have a real incredible collection of stories about the people who are buried here. And this is just a small sampling of really famous people. Of course, there are people who aren't famous. There are people from all walks of life that are buried here, um, but some of them are, um, many of them are writers and teachers and uh, poets. And here we have Bernard Malamud, the novelist and short story writer, Ju Julia Ward Howe, this is over on the left, who wrote the Battle Hymn of the Republic, Harriet Ann Jacobs, who wrote an incredible book called Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl about her real story, how she has escaped from enslavement. Uh, in the center is Isabella Stewart Gardner, the arts patron and the um, museum founder. Buckminster Fuller, the visionary architect and uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the beloved 19th century poet. And on the end here on the right, Winslow Homer. 
at the bottom, I've just put some other names because it's, it's so wonderful to have the opportunity to come and commune with these people like Edwin Booth, the actor, and Joyce Chen, who was an entrepreneur and restaurateur, the poet David McCord, Kurt Gowdy, lots of um, really incredible people buried here at Mount Auburn and many friends for all of us who live in this, who live in this area. I just for, just to start looking, I began, since we're talking at the Cary Memorial Library, I began to look up librarians and there was such a big list. I'm just sharing a few of those with you. Um, that's an example of, um, you know, just picking a subject and thinking, okay, I'm gonna dive deep into Mount Auburn. You can kind of use it as an encyclopedia of Boston history, it feels like some time and um, really uh, find these people by going to our web website and looking up under burial search to see if they're here. And then you can find their monument and, and go visit and pay homage to, for example, Thomas Dowse. He was really a remarkable man. He was um, a book collector and he left his books to the Massachusetts Historical Society. But at Mount Auburn, he erected a, a novelist to himself, but because he admired Benjamin Franklin so much, he also erected an obelisk to Benjamin Franklin, just like his on his own lot. So our story for Mount Auburn really begins in Boston. Um, because Mount Auburn is such a beloved uh, community resource, we forget that its roots were really in the city of Boston. And going back to the 1820s, when Boston Oh my goodness, it, it more than doubled in size, in size between 1800 and 1820. It was a booming industrial city and port town. It was growing very quickly. People were moving in from the, from the country to work. And what happened was the three bearing grounds, the colonial bearing grounds, King's Chapel, Copps Hill in the Granary and the crypts in the churches were full. And they had really, the, they had really run out of room. And so there was a burial crisis. And can you imagine being, um, you know, new to the city, having a, having a family, having friends that you loved uh, and, and knowing that they might not have a safe, clean, permanent place uh, to, to bury them. A lot of the, the burying grounds in town were uh, so crowded that they were kind of falling apart or being moved. And of course, for the people before the colonists, there were a lot of uh, removals and um, um, moving around of burials too. So there was in Boston a real urgency to find land outside of the city that would be permanent and that would be secure uh, to bury, bury people. And Mount Auburn didn't just come out of, uh, it, it came out of this thinking that had started around the 1820s about how are we going to find a burying, burying space outside of the city of Boston. And what happened was Josiah Quincy, who was the mayor commissioned a young physician, um, Jacob Bigelow, to write a report on the state of the bearing grounds in Boston. And Jacob Bigelow wrote, he did in fact, write a report in which he wrote, let's see if I can find it. If the dead bodies be heaped together in too confined a space, if the earth be not proper to absorb the juices and decompose them, if the grave be opened before the entire decomposition of the body, unhappy accidents will undoubtedly be produced. And these accidents are but too common in great towns where every wise precaution is neglected. That's a quote from Jacob Bigelow, who wrote in 1823, a, a report called The Dangers and Duties of Sepulture. And when Josiah Quincy read that, 
and um, assess the situation, he um, passed a decree that there were to be no more burials in the city of Boston. So now that it was an urgent situation, Dr. Jacob Bigelow, here he is in his house. Um, Dr. Jacob Bigelow held a meeting in his home on Summer Street in Boston. And there were about 12 gentlemen who came and they decided that they would begin a kind of task force to look for an extra mural cemetery outside the city of Boston in some land that they could find and hopefully the city would purchase and, um, and, and create a new burying ground for the city of Boston. That was in 1825 and it was really, um, it wasn't easy. It wasn't easy to find the land and nothing had happened uh, for several years until uh, the beginning of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. The Massachusetts Horticultural Society was founded in 1829 and they were a young, enthusiastic group of farmers and, and, and gentlemen, horticulturalists, agriculturalists, and citizens of Boston that were promoting the art and science of horticulture. And they just uh, had gotten started and they elected their new president here on the right, General Henry A. Dearborn. And Dearborn was looking for money to start an experimental garden. In other words, they, they had modeled their horticultural society on, on London Horticultural Society. And they, um, they had seeds and they had the energy and the interest and the enthusiasm, but they didn't have the funds for what they really needed, which was an experimental garden. So Dearborn was, uh, that was his, that was the project that he wanted to push through. Jacob Bigelow on the left, as we know, was interested in finding an extra mural cemetery, an ornamental cemetery that would be in a garden or a landscaped um, or designed landscape for the city of Boston. So when Jacob Bigelow, as a physician and botanist, joined the Massachusetts Horticultural Society as a um, corresponding secretary, he didn't waste any time and he actually just went right up to Dearborn, whom he knew. He, they had met um, working on a committee for the Bunker Hill Monument. And he said, I, you know, I'm gonna propose something to you. I'm gonna propose that the Massachusetts Horticultural Society take on this project of an extramural cemetery, because if we do it, you will be able to have um, your goal of, of an experimental garden because we could fund it by the sale of lots. I mean, it was a really, it's kind of an incredible uh, practical solution that they, they came across because Dearborn embraced the idea, brought it to the Horticultural Society and in his very eloquent um, articulate way made the case that the, um, that the society could, um, lead this project for the for the city of Boston and they could find land and uh, and and they would be able to have their experimental garden and Boston would have an ornamental cemetery in a garden. That was their goal to find this land. Now they had a few challenges because it land was very expensive as you can imagine and um, also not everyone wanted to be next to a cemetery. They looked at some land in Brookline and then they uh, then uh, they were, um, in fact, Bigelow, Jacob Bigelow was approached by a friend of his from college, uh, from Harvard, uh, who, whose name was George Brimmer. And George Brimmer uh, became interested in this idea of a cemetery for the city of Boston. And he offered his country estate for the price that he paid for it, which was 6,000. And um, George Brimmer, he was an architect, an art collector, um, uh, really he wanted to help the society. They all, they all were wanting to make Boston a better place and contribute you know, to the commonwealth 
of the citizens of Boston and, and Bremer um, became one of the founders of Mount Auburn Cemetery because he had purchased this lot for his own estate and he had purchased it um, from the Stone family of Watertown. And this is a painting from the Watertown Free Public Library of the Stone Homestead that today um, would be, if it still existed, it would be in the Cambridge Cemetery land, which at the time, um, at one time, had been owned by Mount Auburn Cemetery. So the Stone family had farmed this land for seven generations, and then George Brimmer bought it. It overlooked the Charles River. And one of the reasons George Brimmer um, purchased this land for his own country estate was because he thought it was such an incredibly beautiful site and it overlooked the Charles River. It had variety, it had hills, it had orchards, beautiful pear trees. And um, he began to design it for his own country estate and lay out, um, lay out carriage avenues and plant some trees. So he was um, uh, really setting a design in place before it was purchased by Mount Auburn Cemetery. Of course, the land had been um, used before the Stone family by the Massachusetts tribe and the Wampanoag and the Nipmuc, who were in the original inhabitants of this land for thousands of, of years. So it wasn't a wilderness that they were buying. It was a land that had been cared for and stewarded for thousands of years. So George Brimmer offers his country estate to the Massachusetts Horticultural Society at cost, um, $6,000. And the legislature then grants the society permission to um, purchase it and to use it as an experimental garden and what they called an ornamental uh, rural cemetery. To plant and embellish it with shrubbery, flowers and trees and walks, and other rural ornaments. So there was already in the language this desire to make it a horticultural space and to make it a beautiful green space, very, very different from the functional landscapes of the colonial bearing grounds that they were all familiar with. This was, this was, um, this was quite different. It was being created not just to bury someone, but to bury someone and make it a place that you want to visit. Edward Everett began to write on, um, to help his colleagues at the Horticultural Society before the cemetery was even designed to extol the virtue and the beauty of the land. And there are many, uh, many newspapers that carry accounts of the variety of the land, the reflective water bodies, the um, steep acclivities, the rolling hills, the mature growth of forest trees um, that were actually getting, it really was a media blitz, a 19th century media blitz, getting people excited about this new project um, by, using, by using the cemeteries. So the original site, was um, was forested, a, a, a woodland. This this is what it looks like today. This is pretty much what it looked like in 1831 when they purchased the land and began to lay out cemetery lots. Um, this is the dell where the, um, it's a vernal pool where the spotted salamanders um, come out and that's where they live. And we were very happy that they're no longer endangered, but we still, are interested in protecting them. Um, this is the vernal pool where on September 24th, um, 1831, the consecration ceremony was held. It's important to note that Mount Auburn when it was founded was not, uh, uh, it, it, it was open to everyone. It was not a religious institution even though it had Protestant, Western, Protest, Western Christian, um, history that was part of the thinking, but Mount Auburn was open to everyone and was 
from the beginning, non, non-denominational. So the consecration ceremony was held in September and the newspaper accounts describe it as a beautiful day with an eloquent speaker, Justice Joseph Story, who you may know as an incredible uh, constitutional law scholar, um, someone who um, wrote the dissenting vote on the uh, Cherokee uh, Trail of Tears, and he became the first president of Mount Auburn Cemetery. And he, at the at the um, consecration, gave a, a beautiful address. He described the site, there around us, all the varied features of nature's beauty and grandeur, the forest crowned height, the abrupt acclivity, the sheltered valley, the deep glen, the grassy glade, and the silent grove. Here are the lofty oak, the beech that wreathes its fantastic roots so high, the rustling pine and the drooping willow. Here is the thick shrubbery to protect and conceal the new made grave. And there is a wildflower creeping along the narrow path and planting its seed in the upturned earth. There were around 2000 people who were there who listened to that. So now here are these men, Joseph Story, George Brimmer, Jacob Bigelow and Henry Dearborn who are working together to create this new landscape, this new commemorative landscape and garden. It, it's really amazing that it was such a collaborative design and that they uh, were responding to the era, the romantic um, change in the thinking about death, the notion that nature is uh, beneficial and healthy and healing and uh, can help the mourner. And they had um, five uh, really big influences in their design. One of them uh, was a Grove Street Cemetery in New Haven, which was a burial ground that opened in, um, in Connecticut after the yellow fever epidemic and it was privately owned like Mount Auburn. And it was the first, what, what, what they call chartered cemetery in the United States. And it had this idea of family lots. It was created on a grid. So it's a very different landscape from Mount Auburn, but it was the, the first of its kind. And Dearborn, Brimmer, Bigelow and Story would have been uh, very aware that this had opened and today it's a national historic landmark. Also a very big influence on their design of Mount Auburn were English estate gardens that had follies and, and water and you know hermit grottos and these beautiful sweeping vistas that were completely artificial and designed to look natural. Um, but again, these were private estates the um, it was uh, the owners who designed them, who, who laid them out in the 1700s. And a little bit like the owners of Mount Auburn Cemetery who laid out their, their new cemetery. Père Lachaise, some of you may have visited, it's an incredible cemetery outside of um, Paris that was founded uh, by Napoleonic decree on a Jesuit estate overlooking the city. And what um, real, and this was in 1804, and both Bigelow and Dearborn uh, knew Père Lachaise well. I don't know if they visited, but they certainly had books about Père Lachaise in the Horticultural uh, Society Library. And what was very important about Père Lachaise and its influence on Mount Auburn is these broad carriage avenues that were interspersed by walking paths that gave very uh, uh, designed uh, views of, of the monuments that were tucked into the verdure, into the greenery of the landscape. This was, this plan actually from Père Lachaise, you can see it right in the land 
at Mount Auburn Cemetery, these broad carriage avenues interspersed with walking paths, very different from the grid of the New Haven Cemetery and um, burial grounds in, in Boston. This is a new idea coming, coming to the United States. Jacob Bigelow and, and General uh, Dearborn also purchased books from France for the Horticultural Library of, of plates of monuments that were being erected at Père Lachaise. Very beautiful books. And one really gathers that they were hoping it was this type of memorial that would be erected at Mount Auburn Cemetery for the United States of America. They were very interested in putting up monuments to, um, to citizens that had done uh, good works and contributed to the country. So they were looking at Père Lachaise. And another thing that I find fascinating is they, the cemeteries, um, the, the Mount Auburn and the cemeteries that followed Mount Auburn were looking at the artwork and the literature that predated their creation. So if you, um, if you go to the Concord Museum and different, different collections all around New England, you'll see these morning pictures, um, embroideries or watercolors, a lot of textiles often done by uh, young women. And, and they look just like Mount Auburn, but they predate Mount Auburn. They're not of Mount Auburn. So the art and uh, the literature was also a big influence on the design of, of Mount Auburn Cemetery. Dearborn and Bigelow and the committee uh, that was the, the cemetery committee of the Horticultural Society wanted to uh, have their landscape that they were going to design look like a picture. They wanted it to be beautiful and they wanted it to inspire the visitor and console the bereaved. So this is a wonderful painting in the National Gallery of, of Mount Auburn Cemetery and a pond that's not here anymore. It was called Forest, uh, Forest Pond, but it was considered the most picturesque area of the cemetery in the 18. 30s. If you if you know Mount Auburn, it's where Narcissus Path is now. It's a it's a little dell and it's it's filled with monuments now. Um, but a very uh, good example of what they hoped the cemetery would look like. I think it didn't look exactly like this when it was painted. I think the artist added some some touches, but but you can see uh, the trees, the flowers and art and nature in harmony, which was the, uh, the, the design goal of, of uh, primarily um, Bigelow and Dearborn. So Henry Dearborn took charge of laying out the avenues and paths of the cemetery. He worked steadily between 1831 and 1833 to enhance the landscape and turn it into a cemetery and his design challenge really was how is he going to get carriages in and through and also create lots of walking paths for pedestrians. So he designed these broad carriage avenues that would be 18 to 20 feet wide without any unnecessary bends and then just like with Père Lachaise they would be interspersed with pedestrian walking paths that, that weren't paved that would take you deep into the, into the trees where you would come across and discover a beautiful monument set in the greenery. And you can see, you can see that today, this is a photograph from um, Mount Auburn and you, you can still, if you get up above the landscape, you can see that plan still of level walking paths and, and broad carriage avenues. So Dearborn subcontracted with Alexander Wadsworth, who was a young um, surveyor. He was a cousin of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, and he came down from Portland to work with, uh, work with Dearborn and Bigelow, and he created the first plan of Mount Auburn Cemetery. The land, when it was first purchased, was 72 acres, and it grew quite quickly to about 100 acres. And the water bodies were very different than they are today. They, they were kind of broad, boggy areas and these sort of globular water bodies. But 
This is the first map that was ever made of the cemetery. And it shows, you know, hardly a straight line. Central Ave as you're going up is straight, but all these other wonderful ellipses take you through uh, the landscape. And that's very similar to the Père Lachaise plan. The cemetery today is 175 acres. So it, it, it grew, they purchased parcels of land over time that were contiguous. And so um, it, it grew over time, but this was the very first map of Mount Auburn. The design was that the, the cemetery would have 300 square foot lots that would be sold to families uh, for $60 each. And the, uh, the design hope was that there would be one central monument surrounded by smaller markers and then surrounded again as a sort of practical and aesthetic solution to protect the lot with a, with a cast iron um, fence. And he, this is just the perfect, um, this engraving by James Smiley from an 1847 guidebook shows uh, this original vision of this new American cemetery, which would have um, trees behind and flowering um, plants in front there would be an aesthetic, um, charming fence, and then a central monument with inscription. And then people from all walks of life would come. They would read the inscription, be inspired, and have uh, uh, admire the proportions of the monument, admire the material, and that they that they would leave the cemetery better for it. That they would they would um, have gained something in their life by having visited. Mount Auburn Cemetery. And Dearborn's real design genius, in fact, his real design genius was creating um, setbacks from the road for planting of flowers and shrubs and between lots for plantings and shrubs. And that um, original design um, that we keep today is why Mount Auburn is, is so beautiful. I mean, there we can really see the success of this design today, even though the cemetery has evolved to reflect current tastes. Um, you can still see and feel the bones of his design and have, um, you know, Mount Auburn really reflects the fact that it was founded by horticulturalists. Right away, they realized that there were people who were traveling, there were foreigners who died, and this is before embalming. And there were a lot of people who didn't want a 300 square foot lot. So they opened areas within the cemetery where you could buy a single grave, which is pretty much how um, we're burying our friends and family these days, um, instead of buying a big square foot lot. Um, we seem are right now in, um, in our, our customers are buying single and double graves. So that is the genius of, of, of Dearborn, these wonderful cranes bill. I think their geranium uh, in balance with the monumentation is, is really uh, one of the joys that you see when you visit Mount Auburn. And also with our climate action sustainability work, we're trying to do less mowing and have a beautiful landscape while we do um, less to the earth and become better stewards as we can um, to, keep, to keep the cemetery beautiful, but um, using more ground cover. So the real contribution to the United States that Mount Auburn brings was not only that it was the first cemetery of its kind, but they also, by putting the, the grave in this beautiful setting in nature, in an urban place, this urban green space that was a garden, they really changed uh, bearing practices across the country because what happened was everyone came and they, they came and they came um, in the hundreds and thousands um, unexpectedly uh, to the cemetery. And actually not unexpectedly, I think both Bigelow and Dearborn um, were uh, known for saying that that this would be one of the attractions of this area because it's near the capital and people would come for, from all over 
and from all over they did, particularly with the, the transportation revolution. I love this little trolley with Mount, Mount Auburn. They came and um, Emily Dickinson came when she was a little girl, uh, a, a young girl, and she wrote her friend about how beautiful Mount Auburn was. Emerson came, Nathaniel Hawthorne wrote short stories about Mount Auburn. People uh, came from, uh, from Europe to see what this new landscape was and uh, to write, write about it. It was a really exciting landscape the way Niagara Falls was an exciting landscape, even though it was still being used as a place of burial and melancholy and mourning, a place where our emotion was worked through and people's lives were being commemorated at the same time, it was a real uh, tourist destination. There were lots of souvenirs that you could buy and bring home and in the archives, we have wonderful examples of, of those as well as this incredible collection of guidebooks that were written about Mount Auburn. So you would come, you would walk in or you would um, tie your horse up in front of the, the gateway or you would um, take one of the omnibus, um, the different forms of transportation from Scully Square, from downtown Boston, and you would have your guidebook in hand. And they often had these um, descriptions of the monuments and then walking paths with routes um, you know, that were recommended and sentimental verse. And um, so there's wonderful guidebook collection. You can learn a lot about who's buried at Mount Auburn and Boston, you know, social history uh, from reading a, a guidebook of, of Mount Auburn. There was a young girl who came, who became Mrs. Horace Mann. Um, and she, uh, she wrote in a letter to her friend about the cemetery. It is covered with the most luxuriant and varied woodland. Paths are cut through, through it in every direction, and the monuments rise from the trees in every direction, enclosed only by a little iron railing, and surrounded, many of them with shrubbery and some with flowers. If you follow the windings of the paths, you come unexpectedly upon these simple and beautiful obelisks. One is a broken column, another a plain column, Mrs. Adams Monument is surrounded with flowers, which she loved so much in her life. That's a letter written by Mary Peabody in 1834 when she first uh, visited Mount Auburn. And here uh, in this engraving by James Smiley, we see a couple, um, um, two people looking at the monument, which is the first monument erected at Mount Auburn, the monument to Hannah Adams. And this area right in front of Consecration Dale with its little wooden signposts was called Central Square. The Boston Courier said, uh, you know, as it regaled the charms of Mount Auburn and the Arcadian lovely, loveliness like no spot in that anywhere in America could match, they, uh, they wrote uh, very enthusiastically in 1838, reader, if you would have the sympathies of your nature awakened, your earthly affections purified, your anxieties chastened and subdued, go to Mount Auburn. The first burial um, at, at the cemetery was of a child um, on Mountain Avenue up by the, uh, up by Washington Tower. And what's, you know, we, we've talked about the landscape design, but much of the landscape um, is connected to the, to the monuments that are within the landscape and also to the chapels, the features, architectural features that are part of the design. It's actually not just nature, it's, it's again, this idea of nature and art combined. And the founders believed that, um, I think they really believed that the dead could inspire the living um, through their character and through their past achievements and their public services. Um, in his consecration address, Joseph Story said, um, you know, here let us erect memorials of our love and gratitude and our glory. It was a place of inspiration. And uh, one, uh, another visitor, American poet actually and writer, Lydia Sigourney wrote, and here the admiring youth 
shall come to see some relic of the great and the good whose fame shall gather greenness from the hands of time. So all of this created a movement that we call the Rural Cemetery Movement that eventually led to the creation later of our public parks and our suburbs. This idea of broad curving avenues, uh, landscape and nature um, combined in, in harmony um, is, is the beginning of of a real interest in Mount Auburn that was copied across the United States by other cities. They too wanted to have one of these rural cemeteries outside of their cities with these features. They were large scale, they were designed, they were open to the public, even if they were private nonprofits, um, suburban outside of the cities. Um, and this new idea of permanent family lots um, that was pioneered by Mount Auburn, which was also a nonprofit uh, corporation. So um, Maria Hastings Carey, who's the founder of the Carey Library that we're um, visiting virtually tonight, is buried in one of these rural cemeteries. Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn was, was created right after Mount Auburn, um, seven years after Mount Auburn. And you can see here that all of these early rural cemeteries um, predate both the, the Boston Public Garden, which was created in 1837, and then um, Central Park, uh, which was designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who was only, um, he was only eight when Mount Auburn was founded. And, but, but who carried through in his design of Central Park, many of what we see at Mount Auburn. Um, the emerald necklace that he designed in Boston um, was designed in 1878. And so much later than, than Mount Auburn Cemetery, but still creating a wonderful green space in an urban environment and carrying on a more professional design that was pioneered by this collaborative group of society, horticultural society, polymaths who were really visionary in, in what they were doing uh, to create Mount Auburn Cemetery. So there was enormous popularity uh, in the 19th century at, uh, for Mount Auburn as a place of natural beauty and, and commemoration. And it, it just, um, it really had a large influence on on the other green spaces of, of our country. Andrew Jackson Downing, in fact, the horticulturalist wrote, um, the idea of a rural cemetery took the public mind by storm. Does not this general interest prove that public gardens near our large cities would be equally successful? And then of course, within 15 years, nine major rural cemeteries were, were patterned after Mount Auburn. And, uh, this, this concept of, of, of places of burial um, became really, you know, in, in nature, in a landscape, um, became very popular. So to conclude, I, I know I'm going quickly. Man Auburn means many different things to many different people. It's not a landscape that is being preserved just as it always was. It's a landscape that's continually evolving and it has many different publics. It has many different uses. It's complex. Every time you visit, it's different. And it's one of my favorite places in the world. It's very special to our family. These are my two boys that grew up here at Mount Auburn and they're now 25 and, and 20. So the cemetery has um, been a part of my family. It's a place where you can um, come and volunteer as a citizen scientist. There's uh, such a, a, a love and um, honoring of the natural world that reflects um, a very strong stewardship ethic at Mount Auburn. So it's a wonderful work that the citizen scientist uh, volunteers are, are doing. Right now, early in the morning, it's very crowded going to be even more crowded with uh, birders fully loaded with binoculars. Uh, Mount Auburn is an important bird site. 
um, an arboretum and a botanical garden that provides food and cover and shelter for all these wild things that live in our landscape. Um, come and help us celebrate the great stories uh, that are here, whether they're for a soldier like um, Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who's being celebrated here um, by our governor or, um, or someone who's, who's a friend or, or relative. Uh, it's a place to be, uh, to, to tell their stories. Come to our Friends of Mount Auburn programs. I have to, this is a big plug for the archives. There are some incredible uh, things to see in the hidden collections of Mount Auburn Cemetery. And we have a wonderful program in Cambridge um, that I think will be at the Cambridge Public Library this summer, actually called um, Cambridge Open Archives, where we share our collections with the community. A really wonderful program. And then of course, Mount Auburn is a really place to come and get centered, to be in the beauty and tranquility um, of nature. There's so many ways um, it serves our community and becomes us a, a real resource. Um, and so our mission, what's remarkable is the mission is still the same as it was <laughs> in 1831, Mount Auburn Cemetery, inspires all who visit, comforts the bereaved, and commemorates the dead in a landscape of exceptional beauty. That was uh, the founding vision, and it's a vision that we still maintain with our remarkable staff um, today. And so I'd like to end with this quote from Celia Gilbert, who was a poet um, who spoke at our 75th anniversary, amazingly, um, back in 2006. I believe that Mount Auburn, if not a poem, is a book, a book we can never tire of reading. Its themes are those of all great literature, time, love, loss, war, and nature. It really is a literary landscape. And I so thank you for joining me um, for a, a quick look at it. And I hope you have some questions and we can talk a little bit I don't think I, I think, I think our time is good. In case you wanna be in touch, I'm just putting up some contact information. We have a website, www.mountauburn.org if you wanna learn more. There are some really great books uh, about Mount Auburn that you can get at your local library. And then we have some collections available um, for browsing online a wonderful transcription project that we're working on with our founding records. Um, and then of course there's Instagram for some amazing photos like this one of spring coming and eggs being laid in the hands of one of our significant monuments. So thank you very much. And I'll, I'd love to answer some questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Meg. That was just a fabulous presentation. We do have plenty of questions uh, so I'm just going to start with this one. You may have already covered it, but it's worth repeating. How did um, Mount Auburn Cemetery get its name? Yes, thank you for that question. There are so many more stories, and this is a good one. Mount Auburn does have a very literary beginning because the neighbors, um, there are some young girls and some Harvard students that would walk the land before Brimmer offered the land to um, the Horticultural Society and the nickname for the land was Sweet Auburn after a romantic um, poem by Oliver Goldsmith. Uh, and so it already was being called uh, Mount Auburn, I mean Sweet Auburn. And so when it came to naming the new cemetery, we do have correspondence in the archives between Edward Everett and uh, Jacob Bigelow, where they were wondering if they should use the word necropolis or not, and they decided not to use that, and then if they should call it Sweet Auburn or not, but they ended up calling it Mount Auburn after the, the largest hill that overlooked the Charles. So for those of you who are local, it, it, it really has a, a the, the cemetery decided to call itself Mount Auburn and then name their highest of the seven hills, Mount Auburn. And then the road to uh, Watertown was renamed um, 
Mount Auburn Street, and then Mount Auburn Hospital was named Mount Auburn Hospital. And I think Auburn, Massachusetts was also named after Mount Auburn Cemetery. There are uh, many, many Mount Auburn cemeteries also all over the world, but it, it came from a, a poem by Oliver Goldsmith. And uh, so it has a nice connection there. Thank you. Are the chapels open on certain days and times to visit the interior space? Yes, they are really actively used and we've had some renovation work going on at the chapel. So they haven't been open. They're not just open um, without uh, uh, being announced that they're open. So on a daily basis, they team that the Story Chapel, uh, which is the first chapel as you enter the cemetery is on your left. And it often has a visitor center and a docent there to help you when you visit, to welcome you. But if there's a funeral or a memorial service, a meeting, a pro program or event, uh, then it's not open. Uh, on the weekends, um, you can find it open. And then we do have open houses that would be a really great time to visit the chapel, particularly um, Bigelow Chapel. Uh, the cemetery has been really busy. Uh, so you could always call and make an appointment to see a chapel as well. Um, I'm really glad you asked that. Thank you so much for that, that question because the chapels are worth seeing inside and it's um, and they're really actively used. Thank you. Uh, Elaine wants to know, are the grounds accessible for people who have limited mobility? Wow, thank you, Elaine, for asking that question because a lot of the work that we've been doing these past two years is to create uh, more accessibility. The grounds, you know, they're, they're paved, broad roads that you can walk on, but they are not perfectly smooth. And I think that we are creating accessibility information. So you can drive all over there are more railings. There's a new project just past Story Chapel on the left where um, the path has been paved and railings have been added and it's um, much more accessible than it used to be. So you are asking a question that we are really um, in the middle of and um, working to change because there are a lot of paths that were muddy and, you know, um, slippery after rain or snow. Um, but I could find out more about that. We're transitioning to a new website and I know that accessibility information is going to be up on that. I, I'm not sure if it is already there, but we could find out more information for you. I'm really glad you asked that because that's one of our major initiatives at the moment. That's um, You'll really see an impact in the grounds for more accessibility. Thank you. Wonderful. I just want to give a shout out to Diane Caffetti. She says she's a master gardener and she volunteers in the landscape a couple of times a month. So I just want to share that. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> a beautiful landscape to be working in. Thank you yes. for thank you for your contribution. I'm just going to move on. Um, Lucinda wants to know what is your favorite monument or story of a person buried at Mont Auburn? It is such a wealth of touchable history. Thank you for that question. I may I may change tomorrow. Um, right now, I'm really interested in a monument that, you know, not many people seem to to know today, but was very important in the 1800s, and that's the monument to Noah Worcester, who worked his whole life for peace. And I'm very interested in finding out his story. So that's a, a current favorite monument, but I've always loved this monument that I'm, I'm sharing on my screen, which is a beautiful um, kind of disintegrating marble um, for Olive Rich. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a copy of an Italian sculpture, which, which, which happened a lot in the 19th century. And, you know, I can't tell you how moving it was to come, you know, out into the landscape after 
the, a New England winter and to see a little nest on her lap, um, that was a very moving um, thing to happen uh, for one of our most significant monuments that I had always loved. It's very tender and she's kneeling. She just has a kind of diaphanous robe on compared to the Italian statue, which is um, doesn't have clothes. And it's just a very tender, moving, um, personal, romantic monument in, in marble. It's one of my favorites. Thank you for that. And that is beautiful. Uh, Anne has both a statement and a question. She says, good evening. Um, I recently read in an article that stated that the Mount Auburn Cemetery is number 13 on the list of the most beautiful cemeteries in the United States. My question is, I've heard that the Lowell Cemetery in Lowell, Massachusetts is considered a sister cemetery to Mount Auburn because of its similarities. Do you have any additional information? Yes, uh, thank you for thank you for that. I didn't know we were 13. <laughs> I just did. Uh, there are several books and several websites that that list the most beautiful cemeteries in the world or the most beautiful cemeteries in Mount Auburn. There are so many and all of them are beautiful, you know, in Savannah and Cincinnati, Forest Lawn and in Buffalo, Oakland, all over. You know, I, I love cemeteries, so I can't I can't choose Greenwood and Woodlawn and Spring Grove and there. Um, that includes the very early Lowell Rural Cemetery, which is beautiful. And it's um, it's one I know well. I, I belong to the Association of Gravestone Studies and we've had a couple of meetings there and we go, um, it's a beautiful cemetery actually. It used to be a little bit more run down and um, it's a rural cemetery very, very early. I just looked it up on my phone. It dates to 1841. So it was only 10 years after Mount Auburn was, was created. So thank you for mentioning that. I'm not sure if you were asking what my, were you asking what other cemeteries I would recommend or? Um, I think she was just asking um, if she had, any, if you had any more information about the Lowell Cemetery. Oh yes, we have more, lots more information about the Lowell Cemetery. We have books about Lowell Cemetery. We have maps and um, I do, I do have actually, my email is here, mwinslow at mountauburn.org. I don't have it in my mind, but I, I certainly have it at my in my office, and I'd be happy to share to share what I know with you about the Lowell Cemetery. Yeah, it's a beautiful cemetery, an early, important cemetery. Thank you for asking. Oh, okay. Susan's unmuted. Go ahead, Susan. What do they charge? Is there a cost for the tours? I understand the tours are fabulous. Ah, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, if you're a friend of Mount Auburn, uh, the, there's no cost. There is a lot of free programming. So I'm really glad I did want to mention that about the Friends of Mount Auburn and the program. There's there's free program. There there's many different levels of programming. So um, we're in um, a transition with our website, but you can find uh, programs by going to the website www.mountauburn.org going to the calendar over on the left and it drops down and all those programs will be up and it will tell you if there's a cost or if it's free. Um, there is a, a range of, of programming and all of it's wonderful. Um, so I really recommend coming coming to some, some programs if, if you have the time and, and interest. Thank you and for asking. Second, yeah. The second question I have is, um, in helping transcribe your history, can that be done from uh, out of town or not? This is a really interesting uh, project, which uh, we did during, we started during the pandemic. I had a wonderful uh, staff person who had done some transcription work. And so we launched that project with some COVID funding uh, where we uploaded our founding records and then people from all over the world just logged in and started transcribing. I, I just, I can't tell you how stunned I was that people, you know, in Australia and Canada and North Dakota and 
Georgia and you know, like every which direction um, were contributing um, transcribing our our records. So many people who who hadn't even been to Mount Auburn, and many people who just enjoyed uh, transcribing uh, contributed to that project. And so we're continuing it because you can do it anywhere. Um, if you have a computer and you have an internet connection, you can do it anywhere in the world. Thank you for that. It's, it's really been a stunning um, silver lining uh, to, our, to our COVID time at Mount Auburn. Thank you. A question about the plants, trees, flowers, etc. Are they all native to New England or were trees brought in from other countries or states in the U.S.? Thank you. Thank you for asking that because I haven't really talked about the trees. They're one of the most beautiful features of the cemetery and the plants. There are 9,000 trees and they're, um, you know, because we're an arboretum and a botanical garden, we, we catalog them just the way I catalog the archives. The, uh, the place to go to see native plants is Consecration Dell because there was a really big initiative to uh, to renovate that um, sort of uh, not not renovate um, enhance that area with all native uh, New England plants. But at the cemetery, you'll you'll find a mix of native and ornamental. Um, as a horticultural society, they started by collecting you know, seeds from all around the world. So there are specimens that are natives and then there are specimens that, um, you know, like special, let's see if I have some rare magnolias um, and Tibetan spruce, and then, and then you know, their native orchids. So you'll see a, a variety. That was one of the goals of the Horticultural Society um, to present to New Englanders a diverse range of plants and, um, horticulture choice. So th there's there's both. And, uh, and of course, we're really paying attention now to, to native plants. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Uh, Judy's asking, what is the process for approving statuary? Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking um, statuary as well as uh, as memorials. There is such a wide range of memorials. And today, of course, reflecting our community, there's much more interest in green burials, for example, that don't have monumentation. But the, um, the monumentation that is in now has um, a relationship to the landscape depending on where, where, where it is. Um, in 1993, the cemetery, um, did a wonderful thing and um, commissioned a, a master plan that looked at the whole uh, acreage and um, kind of identified different, what we call landscape character zones. There are some areas that have only upright memorials. There's another area that has only flush memorials. So different areas of the cemetery have different um, regulations. And so the, the process is really that it goes um, just through the sales staff. And if the sales staff um, needs additional support, then, then they reach out to, to other staff and, and the board member. Um, but really it's, it's preordained by the landscape where the burial space is available, um, if that makes sense. Um, there are sort of complicated formulas about, you know, a certain size upright needs a certain size land around it um, in order um, to be erected at Mount Auburn. Another thing I might add is we really, um, we're really minimizing the monumentation in the land um, we've learned, and um, and we have a scientific study actually going on um, that's just beginning that we got funding for to look at how we can have um, how we can minimize our carbon footprint by what we do. And we've learned that you know putting concrete into the ground as a footing isn't isn't very good for the earth. So we're certainly 
moving away from monumentation, um, we have a lot of, of um, room for cremation burials, um, you know, the next 100, 200 years, but, but Mount Auburn is a very closely knit landscape. And because it's, it's a national historic landmark, we really care for the whole landscape um, as a whole. Um, and so we're very intentional and thoughtful about the decisions that are made um, now, now that there's so much in the landscape. Thank you. Thank you. And could you just mention the search fe feature for people to use in locating graves and monuments? That's a question we have. Oh, sure. So if you go to the website, which is here at the bottom, www.mountauburn.org, a, a tab will come up. And um, on the left is a tab that's called Explore. And if you put your cursor on Explore, there, there will be a drop down box. And right there, it says Burial Search. And you can click on Burial Search. And there's a field where you can enter a full name or just a last name or just the first name and um, look up to see who's buried at Mount Auburn. Is that, is that clear enough? Um, you, can uh, do I it on your, so. you can do it on your phone too. It's a, it's a really great tool. Um, sometimes you have to be careful if a, sometimes names are spelled different ways. So sometimes if you are looking for someone and you're pretty sure they're there, you could try different spellings, but it's a really wonderful thing because um, you can also see where, where the burial is in the landscape. So you can go and visit as well. Thank you for asking that. Uh, that's all the time we have tonight for questions. Um, thank you again, Meg, for a wonderful presentation and sharing the history of this beautiful cemetery, and especially for staying and answering all of our questions. I'm delighted, and I'm so, I so look forward to coming and visiting your beautiful building there in Lexington, and I encourage everyone to come now that the weather's warmer and um, visit and be in touch anytime. Uh, there, there's um, a, a wonderful place we live here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you again, Meg. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, Helen. Bye, everyone. Thanks for joining us.